Hello and welcome to the Dome. The Dome is a place of peace and contemplation and loud vehicle sounds from somewhere outside. It's a place of learning. So let's learn about ADHD. A little bit more than what we knew before. Oh wait, that's not what I meant to do. Let's uh, drag the window and make it smaller. Okay, so... Picking up where we left off, one of the big reasons we're concerned about ADHD is because a lot of kids with ADHD have poor school performance. In fact, if you find a child who's been diagnosed with ADHD and is not showing uh, school difficulties in their grades, essentially, um, that's actually quite rare. Now, productivity is the worst problem, just getting their work done. Kids with ADHD, uh, now almost all of this is the typical hyperactive impulsive type ADHD like I mentioned before there isn't as much research on inattentive type right now although much of this will be um, relevant but kids with ADHD tend to lose their homework a lot tend to forget their homework many of them have comments from their teachers who will say you can do the homework why don't you turn it in you got almost all the way but you didn't put your name on the paper and so I couldn't give you points you know things like that their grades suffer. Retention suffers quite a lot. Kids with ADHD drop out of school at higher rates at every point than other kids as soon as they're legally able to. Now, those things are not necessarily related to IQ or academic achievement issue, or sorry, academic ability. But IQ of kids with ADHD is about seven to ten points lower than kids who do not have ADHD, on average. Now, there's a lot of overlap. There are plenty of kids who have much higher than average IQs, etc. But um, there's plenty of people without ADHD who have much lower than, IQ, than average IQs. But the average differences, I mean, the, the distributions are shifted. So why is that? Think about some of the reasons. And I'm hoping at this point you've learned that you should think don't shy away from the fact ADHD is a neurodevelopmental condition. So it's possible that IQ is lower because when you have a bad brain, you have a bad brain. Whatever it was that led to a different kind of development that gave you the stuff that we call ADHD also led to some other damage in your, in your brain or some di divergent development that means you don't do as well on the things that IQ scores test. So... That's a possibility, which might mean that ADHD uh, abilities are related to IQ abilities. Maybe, maybe not. But you should also think of things like maybe their IQ is lower because of the same reason that kids with learning disability don't qualify sometimes after a while for learning disability benefits. Because maybe if you're in school for a while with something like ADHD, the disorder isn't itself damaging your IQ and it doesn't necessarily mean that your IQ is is lower because you have the IQ, the, or well, your intelligence is lower because you have the disorder. Maybe it's that you just don't get as much education as some kids. You're being in trouble too often. You have a hard time paying attention. You're not getting the information that you need when you need it. You're having conflict. You're disruptive. You're constantly feeling bad because of the consequences of things that have happened. So there's these two sets of possibilities. One of them is more um, social and systemic and the other one is more biological uh, the reality is probably at least a little of both learning disabilities are extremely common in kids with ADHD research uh, shows them coming up at anywhere between 10 and 70 percent of kids with ADHD have learning disabilities this is even that low estimate is much higher than the estimate in the general population now social emotional things are another area of impairment for people with ADHD social impulsiveness drives friends away kids with ADHD now remember hyperactive impulsive type ADHD the criteria which uh, our team dragon I believe dragon anyway the team went over for us uh, that there's hyperactive impulsive type and then there's um, there's predominantly well there's with and without hyperactivity essentially but no matter what you have impulsiveness, except maybe the pure inattentive type. No matter what, you have impulsiveness. So, so an impulsiveness isn't just about doing things, it's about saying things. So you say things that hurt people, that hurt people's feelings. You say the horrible thing out loud that nobody else is supposed to say out loud, and, and they figured it out not to say it. You're reactive, you 
make comments and you do things. You think it would be fun to just punch your friend one time and you didn't really... And if you'd have this time to stop to think, you'd think, oh, well, he won't think that's fun. And then he's not your friend anymore. So friends get driven away. You have higher rates of regression in AD, of, of aggression in ADHD, but it tends to be reactive aggression only. Kids with ADHD are not higher in, like, planned, I'm going to get even with you, This is or this is what I need to do to get ahead type of aggression. It's reactive because impulsivity, because behavioral inhibition is a problem in kids with ADHD. So in situations where they have an immediate, instant, strong feeling, they're more likely to be aggressive than your average person. All of this means peer rejection, and you fall in with a bad, a bad crowd. Remember that pipeline slide um, way back up here, this pipeline? A lot of this can be attributed, not all of it, but a lot of this can be attributed to this um, the social crowd you fall in with. When you're peer rejected, it's not a good thing. I know there's movies that like all the misfits get together and they love each other. In reality, that's rare. Most of the time, the misfits get together and are assholes to each other. They hurt each other. They abuse each other. The kids who bring knives to school and smoke weed behind the gym in middle school, those kids are probably not the kind of kids because of their past experiences, etc. They have their own problems going on. They haven't learned how to, or possibly don't have great abilities in how to be friends, in how to take care of each other, how to care for their friends, how to stand up for their friends. So kids with ADHD suffer a higher rate of social aggression, including from people they might call their friends. When your friend group is limited only to the other socially rejected kids, you know, bad things tend to happen. You, you're on a worse path for this kind of stuff. This is one reason why treating ADHD is important, because ADHD by itself is a certain amount of destructive to the way you can think and the way you can act. But it has consequences all over the place, especially social consequences and educational consequences. Later on, employment and potentially criminal consequences if things keep going. So here's a graph showing, just kind of reinforcing the last point. This is in a study from uh, 2005. So you find that the percentage of popular kids who have ADHD is quite small, but the percentage of rejected kids who have ADHD is extremely large. So we find large numbers of kids with ADHD among the kids who don't have other friends. And they learn bad behaviors from the other kids. They learn to do things that are socially uh, aggressive or inappropriate or damaging or illegal. Anyway, things that kind of put them at odds with the rest of the world. And this doesn't make them more friends. And in fact, it might not even make them the friends they think they have. So it's pretty bad. So the treatment... The picture is kind of depressing because the only thing that really works and really well is medications, but those have some problems associated with them. They have some negative side effects. We're not 100% sure about the long-term consequences of these drugs. When did the first people go on these drugs? The 70s, the 80s? So the first generation of people who have been on ADHD psychostimulants, so Ritalin, Adderall, Concerta, things like this, they're just now becoming adults. Well, they're becoming middle adults. And now we're seeing that there might be some long-term consequences, especially if the kids were on the drugs from a very young age. However, it's this deal with the devil thing. Psychosis has the same thing, schizophrenia. Um, without the drugs, what happens? We don't have other good treatments. I know lots of people will claim there are other good treatments. We have other treatments that help a little bit. Psychosocial interventions, this includes psychotherapy, um, Talking therapy does basically nothing for ADHD. It doesn't even scratch it. You need behavioral methods. They tend to be aggressive, lots of consequences. Um, and consequences usually should mean lots of positive consequences. Reinforcement schedules to help kids with ADHD shape their behavior towards more positive things. But even that, it has limited effects. There's lots of good programs out there doing like social modeling and peer groups. And they can have some really great effects too. But really great effects means moderate to small effects. You get large effects with psychostimulants. Now, even when you combine psychostimulants and therapy, there's not much evidence that the therapy is really adding much. So therapy gives small benefits. If you have people who say, I refuse to do medications for my kid, and the kid has a pretty strong case of ADHD and is screwing up their school and their social lives, honestly, I think ethically, it might be best to try and convince them to use the medications. Maybe not all the time. They take lots of vacations from the medication. Um, in 
you know, coordination with your psychiatrist or MD, whoever's prescribing them, but take the medications because you can have a kid who turns 25 and made it through school or a kid who turns 25 and didn't make it through school. A kid who turns 25 and had some friends or a kid who has no friends except kids who are in jail. I mean, this is a real possibility with somebody who, who has a serious, serious case of ADHD. So why do stimulants help? Why does something, all the drugs that seem to help ADHD are stimulants? As the other team mentioned, they make things go faster. They make things happen more. I'm going to leave this for you guys to think about, uh, although it's the kind of thing that might show up on an exam. And why don't they help over the long term? Actually, why would they? But you should be aware that they don't. There is no long-term benefit of these things. Now, how do they tend to work? We don't know. I mean, we, we know some things, but you never know 100%. The brain is an incredibly complex monster, and it interacts with your environment, etc. By the way, I need to check my... Yeah, we're good. We're doing good. So the brain is a very complex thing, and whenever we create a drug, we, I don't do drug research, whenever science creates a drug that inter- impacts behavior, It's like we look backwards and say, okay, why did that work? Now, there are, we're at the point where a lot of drugs are tailored, are designed because we think, based on past experience, they will work. But even then, we never, we can't account for 100% of what's going on. Like, for instance, SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors with um, depression, we used to think that the reason they worked was because of the serotonin. Nobody really buys that theory 100% anymore. There's a lot of stuff going on. They have lots of effects. If a drug gets in your brain, it doesn't just go to one place. It goes to lots of places. It's in your bloodstream. Isn't it kind of weird? You eat something, it goes into your stomach, whatever happens to make it through your gut and then make it through your liver into your bloodstream. And then whatever of that that circulates through your whole body and then filters out and gets past the blood-brain barrier, which is like it takes the right exits off the highway of your bloodstream into your brain... And then it floats around in your brain. Like it's a weird delivery method, but it it's what we have, you know. So um, the most drugs have lots of effects all over the place. So when this says we think that, and there's lots of good research. I'm not saying scientists don't know what's going on. They have a lot of good ideas what's going on, but most of them would say we don't know all the things that are going on. And this is causality. Why did this happen? Did this cause this to happen? Okay, certainly you can say. This drug caused behavior change. We have clinical trials, control groups, experimental methods. But then getting into the brain, is it because the drug went into this pathway? Is it because it increased reuptake of this neurotransmitter and these synapses? It can become very complicated to figure out, and we don't have all the answers yet. But what we think is that these things affect dopamine and noradrenaline. They activate pathways in your brain that are then helpful for the functions that you need to um, increase your executive functions, especially. So your frontal and your prefrontal lobes, almost all, well, all executive functions that we know of are associated with strong activation of the frontal and prefrontal. Prefrontal means even in front of the frontal, so way in the front of your brain. So front of your brain, uh, frontal lobes, executive functions. So there's lots of activity from these medications in the frontal lobes and in the basal ganglia which has a lot to do with movement maybe a bunch of other stuff because I'm not a brain person specifically Dr. Creeley can tell you Um, lots of pathways all through the brain executive functions are largely kind of housed it's like they live in the front prefrontal and frontal cortex we think but they have connections all over your brain I mean they have to they have to be able to manage all this stuff that's happening so uh, the medications affect executive function areas and paths all over the place. Stimulants increase activity, and that's how they help people with ADHD manage their symptoms and reduce their symptoms, but there are no long-term gains, not even from day to day. These drugs clear the system very fast. Within 24 hours, there's usually almost no trace of them left. And if you know somebody who has ADHD, you can tell when they're on their meds and when they're off their meds. Because when they're on their meds, they, well, they'll have side effects, which is another annoying thing. Um, but they will have the benefits of the medication, and the next day, if they don't take their meds, nothing transfers. They have. It's not like they practiced, and now they're better at it. It doesn't work that way. There's thousands and thousands of people in studies. There's no transfer of this. So anyway, this is um, just a... You don't have to know dorsolateral orbitofrontal, but 
make make sure you understand that frontal and prefrontal cortex are where executive functions seem to kind of live and ADHD is largely a disorder of executive functions not totally but heavily heavy impact on executive functions so three very important meta executive functions in ADHD attention of course We've already discussed that on the last lecture. We talked about attention is an important one and some other ones. Updating. I mentioned what updating was. It's refreshing. It's getting the new information and putting it together with old information to create a new picture of your situation, the world, the social, social world, whatever it is. Behavioral inhibition. I put behavioral in parentheses because there seem to be strong elements of kind of cognitive inhibition that goes with this, like helping you not get distracted, helping you not start down this chain of thought. I said chain of thought. It's usually train, but I meant chain this time. That's weird. And shifting. Being able to shift mentally and emotionally and physically from one kind of a task to another easily. Um, at will. So those are heavily imp imp impaired in people with ADHD. Working memory is another area of impairment. Working memory is heavily involved with attention. Lower working memory functioning means you have lower attention ability. And working memory also impacts many other executive functions. The size of your working memory space, essentially, um, which might not be the best way to think of it, but that's how I do, is one of the things that limits how some of your executive functions are, ab are able to do their jobs. So kids with ADHD tend to have working memory deficits as well as executive functional deficits. Now, how do we assess this stuff? Um, I better hurry here. We're going to have class soon. I'd like to upload this. Clinical interview. Absolutely. You want parents involved. Even You want other people involved. You want people besides the client. Even if you have a 17, 18-year-old client, even if you're working with adults, if possible, get as much perspective from other people as possible. You do IQ and learning disorder type assessments. The IQ assessment, you almost always do. It's not like you're looking for IQ deficits, but the IQ scores help you put a lot of the other stuff in context. And then achievement scores. So your reading and your writing and your math scores and stuff like that. So how people are doing in, in academic areas. And there are also a whole bunch of other questionnaire-based normed tests like the Connors, um, like the Achenbach CBCL. You don't need to know those names. But those are tests where parents or teachers and the child sometimes are asked about speci about a whole range of behaviors and then they rank them on a scale a lot not much a lot in the last six weeks not much um, very little compared to other kids and there are national norms and these are very good at helping diagnose ADHD as well because you can see in a structured way the perception of the child if they're old enough but especially their caregivers and their teachers so when you're working with children you're always working with their parents or their caregivers and if possible if the teachers can possibly make the time you're working with the teachers as well there are also comp performance tests which we thought were a silver bullet back in the 90s when I was first started doing this they're not but they help continuous performance tests they use computer methods where they can measure things like reaction time and which key you pressed very frequently there's a there are a whole bunch of tasks of the format like if a square appears in the upper corner, then press this button. In the lower corner, press this button. If it's blue in the left corner, press this. And if it's the green in the in the right, press this. But if it's blue in the right, don't ever press anything. So you get some simple but complex enough that you have to think about them instructions, and you practice and you practice until they for like a 15 minutes or something until they become kind of natural and almost automatic, like a video game. And then you start to mess with the child and put in a whole bunch of occasionally at random intervals a bunch of stimuli that they should not respond to so you're measuring impulsiveness there are also ways people have tried to measure attentional focus using like eye tracking and things like that so these things help they help quite a lot but they don't replace all the other stuff by themselves they're not very good for diagnosis you can't just give kids the computer test and say now i know turns out they're not that reliable and valid so this is a depressing slide because it's showing that if you have medication, you have big effects, but adding therapy, and there have been many studies like this. This is just one study from 2004. Um, if you add psychosocial things like psychotherapy, even behavior therapy, which is more powerful than most therapies in certain ways, um, you still get almost no benefit. Some studies find 
negative benefit, but I think the consensus is there's a maybe a slight benefit of adding therapy in, ad- in addition to medications, but medications, they just fix things and cause their own problems. But they have effects that are much stronger than psychotherapy and behavioral therapy and other interventions like nature therapy and stuff, which turns out is pretty helpful sometimes. The medications just work so much more, and adding therapy to the medications doesn't make them better. So, uh, combining me- if you have behavioral therapy and you add medication to it, suddenly it gets a lot better. But if you have medication and you add therapy to it, it doesn't get any better. So, here's the last slide I think I'm going to... Oh no, almost the last slide. When I was a kid, it was kind of like a conspiracy theory tinfoil hat thing to suggest that mental disorders of any cause, kind or behavior problems were caused by food additives or toxins in the environment, in the water, etc. A lot of that didn't pan out. Fluoride probably isn't bad, that bad for us. Um, but some of this stuff is panning out. So this is the result of a study looking at tartrazine, which was a common food coloring for many, many years. It's it's much less now, because as it turns out, tartrazine itself seems to have increased ADHD symptoms in some people. There's research on other kinds of things like BPA, the, the bisphenol acetate or whatever it is, the plastic stuff that's in old water bottles, um, and in all your canned food, by the way, in that epoxy that lines the inside of your cans. And the new plastics that are that are BPA free apparently they're just as bad. So these things mess up hormone levels, but they might also um, lead to an increased probability of children being born with ADHD or children with ADHD having increased symptoms. Pesticides, even the amounts that might be left over on our fruits and vegetables, we don't talk about this very much. Researchers are on this, and I think uh, there's a good chance. Well, there's interesting evidence suggesting that these things might be a problem. Whereas for many years, nobody really believed this could be the case. And it's not with everything, it's just with some things, not others. But uh, we don't talk about it because what are we going to do? Our entire society is built around these things. But um, I know a lot of parents who started washing their fruit extra carefully, etc. So children um, with ADHD might also benefit from exercise. So the hyperactivity you sometimes see in ADHD might function as sort of a coping mechanism, or an ameliorating factor. And this is kind of a lovely thing to think about, I think, that ex- an exercise turns out to ameliorate a lot of things. Depression, if you can get a depressed person to exercise, oh my gosh, I mean, yeah, it helps, but it's the one thing you'd rather die than do sometimes if you're depressed. But ADHD, anxiety problems, even psychosis, things like that, exercise seems to be extremely helpful. It's temporary, doesn't last very long, but on the other hand, it's easy to do it every day. Well, for, for most people, it's easy to do it every day. There can be problems with that. So I think that's where I'm going to stop now and go back to our dome experience. It's a sunny day in the dome. You can see my extra plastic hung up here because, you know, it, w- it was here in the snow and everything. I didn't broadcast from the hammock chair. It was a temptation. So maybe next time. All right, thank you.